What I wanted to talk to you about tonight, you all saw in the flyers, is about the current economic crisis. And the basic history of the crisis, what's gone over the last few years, the basic story is pretty much clear to everyone, or clear enough to everyone. If you take a look at the different information sources you can find in the internet or elsewhere, you can get a general idea of the so-called chain reaction that ran from a rather new and exotic sector of the securities trade, trade with the whole alphabet soup of securities, asset-backed securities, ABS, CDOs, CDSs, and all kinds of new terms that we've gotten to learn. This chain reaction ran from disturbances in that section of the financial sector to a near total collapse of the banking system and to a near collapse of the general economy, the entire economy itself. The effects of it have been enormous. Statisticians report potentially 50 million additional deaths from starvation, skyrocketing unemployment numbers in the more advanced countries, a dramatic drop in industrial production and in exports. The crisis already has a few bankrupt states under its belt, and currencies across the globe are tanking. So the crisis is here. And how has the general public reacted to all this? On the one hand, with a great deal of moral outrage. Outrage at London city boys or the guys on Wall Street who didn't understand their own creations, who did irresponsible business that was doomed to fail from the beginning. These guys have the worst reputation that they've had in years, perhaps since the 80s. On the other hand, that moral outrage has long since turned into the hope that the banking system itself get back onto its feet as soon as possible. Most people faced with the consequences of a failure of the banking system hope that the same banking system, whose agents they constantly criticize in very, very harsh moral tones, that they get back to business perhaps with the one change that their business be more reliable and more secure in the future. Same business, more reliable, more secure. And for that reason, so that the economy can get going again, most are willing to make many sacrifices. The unions on the one hand, especially in the auto industry, making compromises on wages and working hours. Many people also accept that America needs to raise its savings rate. Well, what that means is most people will have to accept the limits that, they're impo that their poverty imposes on them. If you have no income, no job, no assets, that also means you're not allowed to have a house. That's basic economic sense. <coughs> Others will have to recognize that they can't afford a second automobile or a first automobile, regardless of how they much they might need it. And these are all the costs people are willing to bear for a return to the status quo. <coughs> and by doing that, by hoping for and even demanding a return to the normal state of affairs, people are ignoring the lessons that the crisis itself has to teach us about the capitalist economic system and what its consequences are for its inhabitants. The lessons that the crisis itself is teaching, that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to draw some simple conclusions from what we've had to experience over the last a few years of the crisis. Perhaps some of these conclusions might even seem obvious to some, but one thing's for certain, if the conclusions I might draw from the crisis seem obvious, they're certainly not being taken seriously. What I mean by that I hope will become more clear. The first lesson I want to talk about that the crisis teaches has to do with the nature of the so-called real economy. And the very first thing we might learn from an economic crisis, especially at this scale, is just what an absurd situation an economic crisis actually is. It's clear to everyone that an economic crisis means a drastic rise in poverty, sometimes almost even a total breakdown of the material reproduction process of society. And yet, is there actually a lack of anything? Is there a lack of goods for consumption? No, in fact, we hear of overfilled store shelves, 
excess, uh, excess inventory. We hear of homes, a rash of foreclosures. It's an interesting thing. The so-called housing crisis that started a few years ago, nothing to do with a shortage of houses. There's even a surfeit of houses. Plenty of goods. A surfeit of houses, too many goods. Excess inventory, too much. Maybe there's a lack of means of production to produce things people need. Certainly not. <laughs> we hear of excess capacity in the auto industry. Too many means to produce goods. And there's certainly not too little labor power to produce all these useful things. Rocketing unemployment numbers mean too many people. The question is too much for what? Certainly not, there's not too much of all this for the needs of the needy. Many would love to be able to move into a house. In fact, there's increasing homelessness. They would love to get into one of these houses. People would jump at the opportunity to get a hold of one of the cars that's on the overfilled uh, car lots. And the same goes for jobs. What the capitalist crisis manages to achieve is something that no other society has ever managed to achieve. This society doesn't suffer from a, uh, let's say, older society suffered from a shortage of certain goods. This society suffers in the face of an overabundance of goods, overabundance of wealth in all its forms. Not too much for the needs of the people, but too much for the purpose of turning a sum of money into more money. Too many houses, too many goods, too many means of production, and too many people for that purpose, taking a sum of money and making more out of it. And if that's the case, then these deep goods are deemed useless. Poverty rises, goods are wasted, means of production wasted, raw materials too. That's an absurdity, again, that only capitalism can manage to achieve. That's not a reason to hope for the recovery of it, maybe it's a reason to question that kind of economic system. But that being said, there is of course one thing that there is a shortage of at the moment, credit. We've all heard term, the term credit, cut, uh, sorry, credit crunch, relatively new term for me. A credit crunch, too, uh, too little credit. What does that actually teach us? If in this economy there's too little credit, then everything else stops. Material production stops. Clearly, credit is the most decisive economic resource in this economy. And maybe that's not too much of a secret to anyone. It's almost taken for granted now that if banks can't give loans, no production gets done, jobs don't get created, growth doesn't happen. But that's actually quite a remarkable fact given the fact that credit itself, borrowed money, doesn't in and of itself contribute anything to the physical process of production. Credit, borrowed money, doesn't facilitate labor, doesn't make working any easier, doesn't create machines with which goods could be produced, and it doesn't create raw materials. If the purpose of the real economy was just to combine these things and make useful goods, Credit would be superfluous. Why would you need borrowed money? You have everything you need. And a credit crunch certainly couldn't affect the real economy. Wouldn't be a shortage of it, you wouldn't need it. But clearly credit is useful for this economy. The question is for what? Credit is useful for financing production. What does that mean? Credit is useful for gaining access to and getting hold of all the sources of wealth in the society to be able to produce more. Getting a hold of all the things from which a producer would otherwise be excluded. If you don't have borrowed money, if you don't have money, you can't get a hold of all the things that are needed to produce goods. (laughs) The usefulness of credit, the basis for its great reputation, therefore has to do with the fact that all wealth in this economy, all wealth in this society, is private property objects that are subjected to the exclusive ownership of their owners. On that basis, credit is useful. That's a remarkable thing. Everyone takes for granted. Money, borrowed money is useful. If you don't have loans, you can't do anything. 
only because everything won't be used for production, not for goods, unless the owners of those goods have their money needs satisfied. What that means is credit's usefulness is based on the fact that everything is subjected to the rule of private property in this economy. That's an unpleasant fact. So, in the form of credit, this power to get access to and get hold of goods, all the sources of wealth, in order to produce more money. In the form of credit, that goods becomes, becomes a tradable commodity. It can be bought and sold, or rather lent and borrowed. A bank advances a sum of money to an employer who's allowed to use that property as if it were his own, gets a hold of the money, can produce more money, pays the bank back. The price that an employer needs to pay for that power is interest. Obvious enough, so what does that mean? That means credit is only, or getting credit, is only a useful transaction for a capitalist, or for, say, more neutral, a producer in the so-called real economy, is only a useful transaction if he can use that money in order to command labor, other people's labor, in such a way as to produce more wealth for himself, higher than the interest rate. Credit is only useful for him if he can use it to make a profit. And credit does just that. It expands a producer's ability to command labor, to exploit it, to create additional profit. That's what he uses credit for. And if a producer can't get a hold of that credit, then he's out of the competition. If a whole real economy can't get a hold of credit, then there's no production. What that means is the real economy can only be affected by a credit crunch because it pursues the exact same purpose as the banks. Think of the good reputation that the economy has right now as a so-called real economy, busy with the production of goods and the creation of jobs. Perhaps it's never enjoyed a better reputation than now. But the fact that it can be affected by a so-called credit crunch, by a lack of credit, means that it's no different from the banks. Its purpose as well is to take money and to turn that money into more. Credit expands the power of capitalists to do that. That's why this talk of the bad speculators on the one hand and the good producers on the other hand just makes no sense. There's an identity between them. Their purpose is the same. <coughs> 